everyone. Welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Handweavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I am the Advertising and Marketing Manager for HGA. Today, Textiles and Tea is sponsored by Made in America Yarns. See their full range of beautiful yarns at madeinamericayarns.com. We will have questions today. Um, probably like the last 15 minutes. And if you would use the um, Q&A button, don't put it in the chat. Uh, please put comments if you want in chat, but we kind of lose the questions if they go in there. So put your questions in Q&A and we will get to as many of them as we can. Uh, today, I'm very excited. We have uh, Janet Phillips from Somerset, in um, England. We're such an international program here. Janet studied at the industrial design at the Scottish College of Textile, graduating with first class honors degree in 1972. For 35 years, she, um, she was doing commission work. And then um, she decided that she wanted to go back to just teaching and uh, teaching weaving design in her studio. She is the author of three design books. The first book is The Weaver's Book of Fabric Design, and that was published in 1983. In 2008, she published Designing Woven Fabrics, um, and that has been reprinted three times and sold over 4,000 copies. Those of you who have the book know why, and if you haven't seen this book, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's an amazing book. She has a new book out. It came out in the fall. Uh, it is Exploring Woven Fabrics, and I'm sure she'll talk about some of that today. I'm very excited to welcome Janet Phillips. Hey, Janet. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. First question, what is your favorite tea? Um, I like fancy teas, things like um, Earl Grey and the Smoky Lapsan Souchong. That's my favorite ones. Oh, good. We figured somebody from England would be a tea aficionado. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I only drink it in the mornings, though. You are oh, well, afternoon tea, I suppose. So I, I drink tea in the morning, actually. Okay. Mm. Well, we want to start with you talking a little bit about how you came to be a fiber artist. How did you get started in weaving? Um. Well, it was. Um, I suppose. I think it's in my DNA, to be honest. I don't know what else I'd do if I didn't weave. Um, even as a young child, I was very um, interested in fabrics. I was very fussy about what I wore. It had to be pretty dresses. And I used to collect ribbons and collect braids and made my own clothes as a teenager. And um, But it really started in about 1967, when I was just 16. And um, we just moved from Glasgow to Edinburgh because I was br brought up in Scotland, actually. And um, my grandparents came to stay from London. And my parents took us out on a day trip to a place called Gala Shields, which is about 30, 40 miles south of Edinburgh mm -hmm. and is the centre of the Scottish tweed industry. And we spent the day um, looking at mills because that's all there was in Gala Shields. Um, we could have gone anywhere that day. I don't think there was any particular reason to go to Gala Shields, but one of the mills we um, visited was a man called Bernard Klein, who in the early 60s, well, in the 60s, was revolutionising the Scottish textile industry by weaving these amazing fabrics in wonderful colours and wonderful yarns. And I can remember myself standing in that mill just feeling so excited that you know just with what I was seeing and um, that little notion in your head that maybe you could earn your living doing this mm. but then we went home I started a new school because we just moved house and I and it was really heads down just trying to get my university it, um, examinations it was in, in Scotland they call it the hires so I had to sit my hires that year and I did okay in my hires so um, I would say maths and art and history were my strong subjects. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, though. And actually, I went back to school the following year in the September to take some more hires because I didn't know what else to do. But within a couple of days, it was quite obvious that the school had nothing to offer me. Oh. So they sent me to the library 
and I waded through these piles of prospectuses. And on the second day, I came across the Scottish College of Textiles in Gala Shields. So I was back in Bernard Klein's Noodle. And I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so the headmaster got me an interview. Actually, I remember that interview because um, I thought I was being a really trendy designer. I'd made myself a, a coat out of a really pop arty fabric. It was really bold on a beautiful linen quality. And it was really short because it was the mini skirt era, you understand. And I thought I was the cat's whiskers, you know, going down for this interview. And the guy sat me down and gave me an arithmetic test, which is, which actually I'm quite happy with numbers. And that was it really. He said, that's how he could sort out the kids who could cope with the weaving course and who couldn't. Oh, with the math. Yeah, that's all he really did. He said, if you're keen and you want to come and you can work with numbers, you can, you can come. I loved it from day one. So yeah, like, like two weeks later, I left home, left school. I was 17. And I, and I still marvel at the fact that I, I found something that I, I truly love and have loved all my life at such an early age. I was very lucky. I was given a 24 shaft dobby loom on that first day. And um, yeah, a loom just like that. It's called a George Wood, a George Wood Dobby loom. Mm -hmm. You might notice it's got three shuttle boxes on either side. So I can have three colors going simultaneously with a fly shuttle. But actually what we wove with a was a four shaft color and weave effect sample blanket, a very similar to the one that um, I have put in my new book, Exploring Woven Fabrics because uh, we were told at the time, and I realize certainly now that the, those four weaves, plain weave, two and two twill, one and three twill, and three and one twill are the basis of all weaving. And if you can understand what's going on there, mm -hmm. you would understand all the basis of all other structures. So, you know, that's the way I was taught. So that's the way I'm still teaching. Well, I have heard an interesting story about you and weaving rugs. Would you share that with us? <laughs> well, that was after I left college. Um, it was actually just at the end of the, well, the beginning, should I say, of the decline in the Scottish textile industry in the borders of Scotland. And um, I went off to London to um, get a job in the end. But I didn't, anyway. When uh, I didn't really enjoy that job, I worked for Wallace Shops. It was a fashion house and I was working with the buyer to um, source fabrics for the coat and suit department, but I, I, it was out of my depth and I was not happy with it. And after two or three years, I left, got married as one does in those days, very early, young. Anyway, we moved to an area of the country where there was no mill. So I decided to buy my own George Dobby loom and start weaving. And I decided to weave rugs. I thought, well, anybody can read a rug, she said, a uh, plain weave rug. I thought this would be easy peasy. So um, I wove just a plain weave rug, a pick and pick rug. You might know what I mean with sort of two colors alternating and you get these sort of colorful vertical lines, lovely colors, sold really well at some local craft fairs. But six months later, they were all back. They, they were starting to fall apart. Basically, I hadn't woven, beaten the weft in hard enough. So I had to weave them all again. And I, I solved the problem by buying a copy of Peter Collingwood's book, mm. The Techniques of Rug Weaving. Yep. And mm. I, I read that book and it, it really left a lasting impression on me. It was just his whole attitude and his sort of attention to detail and I basically did what he told me to do mm -hmm. and I wove a perfect rug and it's I often feel that oh yeah these are some very early rugs that I wove I because I had a, a shaft loom I could get um you know I have 16 shafts I could get shapes without having to use the system that he calls shaft switching wow. with any of your rug weavers. Um, <clears throat> these are linen warps and um, wool wefts. I probably wove those sort of, I used to weave those rugs really only on commission. I never wove a rug on spec to sell 
these are rugs that people asked me to weave for them. I would go to their homes and we'd discuss what they wanted and um, where it was going to live. And I find in order for me to design anything really, and a rug is no different, I need to have kind of like a design brief because that's really what I was trained to do as well. That's what we did at Gala Shields is to kind of weave fabrics for a purpose. So you know where it's going to live, who's going to have it, how they're going to use it. And that gives you so many design ideas or answers so many questions that um, helps me anyway to make this design decisions. That's well, my, my next question, it, it, may, it may be self-explanatory. It's a, how would you describe yourself as an artist or as a craftsman? Well, I could say a bit of both. I, I like to think of myself as a jobbing weaver, to be honest, because <clears throat> I, a, a, as a career, I will weave anything. I don't have a specialism as such. And at the other side, I like to think of myself as a designer. Mm -hmm. That's the aspect of the process that I enjoy the most. Yes, I do have to weave. And therefore, I'm a weaver. And that puts me into the category of being a craftsman. Uh -huh. And I hope to think that because I'm doing original work that has been designed, that maybe puts me a little bit into the artist as well. It's a combination of all, all really. Mm -hmm. And one sells one's work at craft fairs. So um, I suppose I must be a craftsman then. <laughs> like that. That's what they call me. That's what I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I used to do a lot of, um, well, again, on commission, these were commission pieces with if somebody wanted some clothing. Again, I would um, talk to them about what they wanted, where they were going to wear it, why they wanted to weave it, what mm -hmm. colours they liked best. And um, because I sample a lot in my weaving, I, you can show a client something and give them an idea of what they might like and you get a sense of what they like and what they don't like so that when you then have have the design brief the colors and everything that they feel they want you only really need to weave one more multiple section sample blanket to present them with a swatch of fabrics that they can choose from that they might say yeah yeah that's the one i want it's not a lot of extra work if you've done done a lot before I think I know what you mean by a design brief, but can you explain that a little bit? Well, I, I'm making functional fabrics, right? right? So I need to know what, it, what am I making? Where is it going to live? And that will tell me what yarn I might need, what set I might need, what type of drape I might need for this cloth. Uh -huh. Who's going to use this cloth what are their favorite colors that'll give me an idea of what the color might be or where is it going to live in which room is it going to live that will give you an idea of what colors you might want how big is does it need to be and so many design ans uh, queer questions have been asked answered and that's a design brief Oh, okay. I know I've got to weave a cushion in these colours because it's going to live there. So it's going to have that type of yarn. It's got to be washable or not washable. It just tells me what I need to focus on in order to design a fabric that that person. So you went like. from weaving to designing and to the fitting of the piece. You did with the whole spectrum, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, you mentioned colour and I wanted to ask you some about that. Um, if you could talk more about your use of colour or how you work with color but in this uh, you have a postcard here right yeah i have a postcard here well this if i you know in a way if i don't have a client then i find myself a picture right in terms of colors right and this is a classic example of what i might find this is a picture of the pyrenees actually a pyrenean meadow and when i look at a picture like that turn it on its side, I see a stripe because weaving is all about stripes and checks. And the first thing you have to do is design your warp, which will be a stripe. It's either going to be self-colored or it's going to be a stripe. So something like that, 
I can see the sky, I can see the mountains, I can see the poppies, and I can see the yellow foreground. So to me, that gives me a stripe. Mm -hmm. Or any landscape picture, if you just cut out a, an inch wide strip out of a, across a landscape, you'll get a stripe pattern. And I will use that stripe pattern as the basis of a warp. I will also use the colors as accurately as possible. I, I would say the thing that really improved my weaving was when I started to dye my own colors. And so if oh, I take really? an inspiration oh. course, uh, picture <clears throat> like that, I will, I will dye the yarn to those colors, which I hope is what it's illustrating in the cloth. Because there's so many yellows and so many reds your average yarn supply just doesn't give you that range. And when color is such a crucial part in the design of a cloth, I like to be able to get the exact color that I want in a cloth. So I will either do it from a picture. And, um, how else do I choose colors? When I was writing my book, Designing Woven Fabrics, I actually was, was talking about what I call design criteria, color being one of them. Mm -hmm. So I actually had to write out, well, how do I choose color? And it was quite an interesting exercise because I feel I usually choose color. Well, I don't know how I was doing it, but I, I do it. And, but I had to kind of analyze how I do it. And I realized how I do it. I basically have a picture of the color wheel in my mind. Uh -huh. And if you want to mix color, and weaving is all about mixing colors. The whole point about it is that you get little, you don't mix the colors it, like a painter would on a palette and then apply it. You mix the colors. And if you mix red, yellow, and blue together, you're going to get brown. And it's a classic problem in a way of, of weaving that you make this wonderful warp and it's all bright colors and you start weaving it and it dulls. <laughs> Has that happened to you? <laughs> I, well, I I'll give you there's three, there's three there's three ways that I go over this problem. One of them is I have my color wheel in my mind. So if you're taking a color wheel and you're taking each, each quarter, you take colors that are kind of close together on the color wheel, they'll blend, they'll enrich each other, they won't dull it. As soon as you take colors from opposite sides of the color wheel, you are in fact mixing red, yellow, um, and blue together so you're going to get brown you're going to dull it so you have to pick colors that are kind of if it's a red and a green you know it's sort of a which are opposites and a green's made up of blue and yellow yes you know choose a a ready blue and a ready yellow so you're not taking that so they're more in keeping with the green then they are complete opposites. Can you uh -huh. see them? And you'll get less dulling. The other way to deal with it is to <clears throat> do it in, in terms of set. If you've got a balanced cloth, that's when you're going to get most color mixing and most dulling. So, or a twill or something, a little weave like that. Set of maybe 24 ends per inch, 24 picks per inch. If you change the set to about 28 ends per inch and 20 picks per inch, You've got the same quantity of yarn there, the same weight of yarn. The drape won't have altered that great, but you'll have a slightly warp dominant coloring. So it'll, it'll dull less. Yes, that's one way of doing it. And the other way, of course, is to choose a weave structure that has much larger color areas. That isn't such a mix, like a twill is very much short fibers, sorry, short floats that are interlacing together to get your di diagonal lines. Whereas double cloth, for instance, interchanging double plane gives you big areas of color. Diversified plain weave gives you big areas of color. Um, pinwheels, any color and weave effect, weave structure will give you bigger areas of color so that you don't have that dulling effect. Oh my have, I made, have I made sense? Can you see? What oh, I'm absolutely, absolutely. But my next question is, why, um, why did you write a book? And now I'm thinking, I just want to thank you for writing the book. But what, what made you say, I want to write a book? 
<laughs> All three well, times. <laughs> Well, I had a break, if you like. I had a break when I was very young. When I was 28, I was only, what, five, six years out of college. And I was asked to write a book. I was at a craft mm -hmm. fair. And, and I wrote this book, the, the Weaver's Book of Fabric Design. Because at that, at that stage, I thought I knew everything. But actually, of course, I didn't know as much as what I know now. And uh, I relied on, I, I basically, it's my notes from college, that book. The weaver's book from of fabric design oh, okay. right. it's perfectly adequate information it's it's perfectly you know correct but it never has any, much of me in it it's not kind of me and my weaving mm. and i often after i did that book one it, it, it gave me two thoughts one it made me prove that i could write a book which was really something that i hadn't thought about doing and I felt I really wanted to write another book that was me and my weaving. Oh, okay. The yeah. trouble was it took me another 25, 30 <laughs> years <laughs> to actually, in a way, have the confidence to feel that I had a method uh -huh. that was maybe a little bit different and to find a subject that was different perhaps to all the other excellent weaving books that are out there. Mm -hmm. And it came about really through teaching. When I was about... It was, must have been about 1987. So I'd been sat at the loom for uh, 15 years already, not doing any teaching. And I was asked to teach, we call them in the UK community education classes. It was in Oxford. Oh, right, you know? right. And we had this amazing <clears throat> two porter cabins right at the back of this sort of the further education college. And it was full of looms. We had 30 table looms and about 20 floor looms completely ancient they'd been there since the first world war we just about got them going kept going and I had 18 students for a three-hour course in the morning and 18 students for a three-hour course in the evening and we had a wonderful time and um, one of the girls after coming for several years she said she didn't want to do a finished product she went which is what basically what we did they they told me what they wanted to weave and we designed they we designed something and they wove it she wanted to weave a sample blanket in fact she came with me with a, a hand woven magazine which had this um, sample blanket in it it was a straight threading and about 20 different liftings uh what did I think? I said it was a great idea, but it would be a total waste of time weaving it if you've only got straight threading, one threading plan. While you're weaving it, all these liftings, you might as well have other sections. So I wrote her out half a dozen other threading plans and she wove this cloth. Rona Walker was her name. And uh, she came back about two weeks later, so she wove it at home. She it was a truly the most ugly cloth I've ever seen. She wove it in a rug yarn. It was a sort of a beigey two-ply rug yarn, beigey warp and a dirty pink weft. It was truly the most disgusting cloth out, but she she was very excited about it. <clears throat> and um, I suggested that it was great, but she should weave it again so that we could see the patterns clearer in a white warp, a nice clean white warp and a navy blue weft. And she wove this sample again. And me and the whole of the class were just really excited about this sample blanket. For me, there were these multiple twills in it, um, and um, which if I'd looked at them in a book, I'd said would need eight or more shafts. And I, they, I was getting them on four shafts. And it was just really exciting. And all the other girls, you know, they're mainly girls, there might have been the odd guy in the class who um, got excited about it as well. And they're all asking me, how do you, how, you know, I want to weave this pattern, I want to weave that pattern, how do you do it? I said, I've got no idea. Got to ask Rona, she's the one that knows it. So in the end, I wove this sample blanket. Of course, when I did that, I put on an extra 10 threadings and thought of 50 or more <laughs> liftings. And for, for somebody like me, who was brought up on weaving on 24 shafts, to find so many variety of patterns that could be woven on four shafts was just a revelation. And I got really, really excited about weaving these patterns and the, the reaction of the girls in the class was just overwhelmingly excited about it I realized I had a book there so I spent the next six years weaving well that books that's the sample blanket for uh, for um, 
designing, uh, exploring woven fabrics. It's the twill sample blanket is the one for um, designing woven fabrics. If you can get that picture up, it's just, um, but um, I spent, so I spent, anyway, I spent um, four years um, or six years just weaving four shaft work. And it was really exciting. <clears throat> and the book is so basic, I think, in terms of how to construct weaves. And it, has, it covers all the different design criteria that you need to think about before you can weave a fabric. So it covers quite a, a big area of um, information. And it's the way I do it. Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> I'm going to, I want to ask you about um, sampling. And I'm going to read something from your book. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> it says, I cannot emphasize enough the need to sample in order to design. It is only when the threads are actually interlacing with each other that you can see the outcome of color mixes and set calculations. The very act of weaving causes a straight warp to undulate. It puts tensions and distortions in the yarns that cause them to move. It causes colors to mix together and change. The outcome of these combining elements can never be accurately predetermined. I just talk some about that, that paragraph, that statement. <clears throat> Well, that's why I'm still interested in weaving after sitting at my, you know, I've been weaving since 1967. I mean, I'm 50 years at the loom and I still find it exciting. And that's because I know that a minor change will make a big difference. Mm -hmm. No matter, you can maybe use the same yarn but or the same count number of yarn, but one will have more twist in it than another. The f a different fiber combinations will react differently. Color, I mean, you know, color variation is massive. And I always weave, I was taught to weave, and I still weave these multiple section sample blankets. I mean, we were taught to do that because I was taught to be an, an industrial designer. And so I have to present swatches, right, to clients. So you get that by weaving these multiple section sample blankets of, say, six inches wide and six of them six it's only 36 inches in loom and you you have each section is a different colorway or a different threading or a different quality of yarn and you you weave away and it's not the crossing so when when this distortion happens and this variations happen and that's how you develop new ideas can you yeah and yeah. so i do a lot of sampling i mean still after 50 years of loom I don't weave any finished product without sampling first. Well, unless I've, it's exactly the same yarn. I'm hearing groaning. Yep, yep, that's groaning. Sampling isn't always welcomed, is it? Did you, do you find that your students are like, oh, I don't want a sample, or is that just me? No, but, um, well, I think after time, if, if, <clears throat> it depends whether you're happy with what you're weaving. Right. Oh. If, if what you're producing you like, great. But if there's an element of something, I'm not quite happy with this. So I, I didn't realize that would happen. Oh, it's, it's all again. It's all playing. There's, it's sampling is just playing around. It's just, just have a go. Don't make you know. It's it can't be anything but more fun from my point of view. Yes, and then you get these. And again, the more th threadings or more variety of warp sections you can have for whatever variety it is. Quite often, some of these sample blankets look pretty messy, you know, and a lot of the patterns don't work maybe as well as you dreamt they would, because that's, mm -hmm. that's why we sampled to find out that, or some work better. But they're always, I'm sorry, I'm getting all my <laughs> emails coming in. Um, here. <laughs> there's always a nugget or two within that sample blanket that it was unexpected. And you think, yeah, I really like that bit, that tiny bit up in that corner. That's the bit I'm going to take out and refine. And like anything in design, it's the detail, going back to Peter Collingwood, what he told me all those years ago, mm -hmm. everything matters and you have to, and it's the detail that makes something special 
that allows a hand weaver maybe to charge a little bit more for their piece than if it had been more ordinary. Well, Marie France <clears throat> Gosselin, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, is asking a good question. I didn't even think about this. Do you use the software to design or do you just draw it out? How do you design? I, I, I now have a computerized Dobby loom. So yes, I okay. have to use computer software, but I don't actually use it for designing. Oh. I do all my my initial design work on a bit of paper. I mean, if you read Exploring Woven Fabrics, you can draw out a, just a shape, a black and white shape on a bit of paper can give you a threading plan and a lifting plan. Mm -hmm. And from that, I will just decide, oh, I'll do that. I'll do, I'll do, plan this multiple section sample blanket of different threadings, different colors, different weaves, anything, anything that I can think of that I think might relate to this design that I'm going to have to develop. And um, I weave away and I might put two or three different samples on. Well, I refine it, you get it and then get that nugget and then you do another bit and then you do another bit. And then when I, I'm pretty clear about what I'm actually going to design, I will then put it onto the computer software. I use Fiberworks and um, Okay, Fiberworks. Yes. So then, okay. then you can put all the repeatable units in. You can check for joins, uh, and it prints you out a beautiful threading plan and warping plan, and works your heddle counts out for you. So, it's at that stage when I use the computer software. But no, I, I, it's all done on the loom, my designing, because, because the quality of the yarn is going to change and the. Yeah, yeah. Color's going to change. I can just change one end or two ends on the loom. I mean, the computer software can give you an idea of color, but it's only when you've actually got that thread on the loom that you know it's the right one or not. Yeah. Um, one of your one of the beginning of your book, you, you have a statement and you just said it while ago. I love it says a minor change can make a big difference. Yeah. That, that's, what, that. that's why I still enjoy it, because I know, in a way, it's out of my control. It's exciting. I, I still, it never turns out like what I think it's going to turn like, like out. <laughs> and sometimes you're disappointed, but you can work on it. You can change things. And, and it is exactly which is why I still enjoy it. I still find it interesting. It doesn't become boring. Because what do you think you would have done if you hadn't become a weaver? <laughs> I, I think I would, I think I would always be in some sort of design aspect. I, I, I certainly at school, I really enjoyed um, graphic art. Oh, okay. I, I love, I love letters and, 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 you know, and sort of that type of design work. I think I'd be a graphic designer. Is that Probably something? Heard more money. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm still <laughs> cheerful about it, so it doesn't matter. Um, somebody else was asking about where you get your um, yarn, since you use such different um, different kinds of yarn. They said, where do you source that? I tend to buy my yarns white and dye them. Um, I think get most of my yarns from UK suppliers. There's a my silk I get from a company called Gadam and Gadam, which is um, in a place called, well, they used to be in Macclesfield in the um, Midlands of UK, of England. Mm -hmm. And that was the centre of the UK silk industry. And they've moved to Leek recently, but they have very good quality silk yarns that I buy white and dye. Um, we can You're get still dyeing, doing your own dyeing? Oh yes, I use acid dyes mainly because they are so accurate in their dyeing. You can you measure it out with syringes, and you can really re-dye to the same color, which I find very useful. Right, right. And silk just takes the color so well. Mm -hmm. We can get wool yarns in the UK, no problem at all. I mean, there's several UK suppliers. Um, cotton yarns, I don't do a lot of cotton, but um, and that's more difficult for me to dye, but I do use Procyon dyes for the cotton. Okay. But you can't be quite so accurate. 
with the color. Is that why you don't use cotton so much? Is because the difficulty? Also, it's not quite such a luxury fiber, so you're not going to get. It's all to do with what you can sell it for. <clears throat> On the whole, oh. color cotton yarns, even though the yarn is actually quite expensive nowadays, cotton yarns. Mm -hmm. You don't. The end products aren't so luxurious, so you might not be able to charge so much for it. I know cotton is getting more and more difficult in the US to get. I didn't know if that was true in England. It is, and it's gone up in price. It's more oh, yeah. expensive than, you know, some of the silk yarns mm -hmm. now. It is. Um, but um, I source yarns from mainly UK suppliers. Okay. I, I did, I do, there's a um, Habu Textiles. There's a Japanese company oh, that, yeah. Yeah. that um, produces beautiful um, yarns. So I get those specialist yarns from them. And there oh. used to be a company called Texura Trading, where I used in America that I used to get my um, elasticated yarns from. It was wonderful quality stuff. So I did import those, buy them directly from the US. Okay. Well, I want to go on to um, a uh, design that you did that was both art and science. Can you talk some about your shoulder? Pack? Oh my. Yeah, I had a very um, exciting project, I thought it was, and I wove this beautiful cloth, which you've just put up. Um, it was, I worked with um, some surgeons at the Nuffield Hospital in Oxford. They were shoulder tendon surgeons, and apparently uh, to heal or a break in a shoulder tendon is notoriously difficult and unsuccessful uh, mm -hmm. surgery. So they were trying to get over the problem by de developing what they called a patch to hold the two, stick the two sides of the um, break together. So I they asked me to weave different qualities of weave structure in suture yarn, the actual thread that a doctor would sew up a wound in that actually that will then dissolves when it heals yes you might have had to have something sewn up in your life and this is actually a, a little bit of twill woven with sutra thread they were only short they only were about um two meters long each thread so i had to like put individual threads uh it was a long project i worked with them actually weaving little plain weave squares about a centimeter square tiny little things and then they came back about two years later after doing a lot of experimenting with woven structures knitted structures crocheted structures sort of felted structures but they decided that weave was the method that would give them the most movement or elasticity or stretch and uh, that's when i had to weave these um little squares in different um, um, structures. They were spinning their own, they had this machine in the um, laboratory in Oxford where they were spinning suture thread very much thinner than the sort of ones that um, I've woven out of here. I must admit, I found it fascinating and, you know, it was maybe the only piece of weaving I've ever done that's truly helped mankind. It was a very interesting project to be working it's on. A, it's a great example of STEM to STEAM. Yeah. You know, from science to arts. That, yes. I, that's wonderful. Thank you yeah. for sharing that with us. Well, of course, woven fabrics <laughs> is, are, you know, we couldn't live without woven fabrics. I mean, they are in every aspect of our lives, you know, belts, you know, for machinery belts, car, car belts and seat belts, let alone sort of textiles that we're using. Uh, it, it, it infiltrates every aspect of our lives. So it's a very important skill to know. Yes. <laughs> well, I think we will start looking at some questions, if that's okay with you. Yes, certainly. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, somebody was, uh, Jenny Hockey was asking if that was bound weave, and I'm assuming she was referring to the rugs. That we showed at the beginning. Yeah, they they were the technique that I would I would call a Peter Collingwood's three end block draft. Um, they were the the tech the weave structure that um, Peter Collingwood used the most. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's really like a, a summer and winter rug structure, except it's over three ends instead of over four ends in the repeat of the weave. But it's a very similar structurally with that. And um, you have two colours alternating in the weft and you can bring the colours up in different blocks. Yeah, it's not. A well, Paula has a, a great question. No, Paola, I'm sorry. Um, do you prefer design freely to follow an idea or would you rather be given the brief that you were talking about um, between the two, which do you prefer? I need a brief, even if I'm not, if I'm doing something for myself, I still need to know what I'm making and why I'm making it and where it's going to live. Mm -hmm. I do need to have that, that framework. It doesn't mean to say that I'm going to be restricted in what I can do. Uh -huh. It's just that I, I like to know what I'm weaving and why I'm weaving it and what because that gives you drape you can determine your set and I mean when I'm sampling I mean I, I will sample for set I'll, I'll cut the warp and re-thread it to different sets because mm -hmm. sets a huge tool uh, you know well, somebody it, was asking that when you do all of these different weave structures how do you set the set well it doesn't matter you see you just <clears throat> get an average you just work on it doesn't matter what you do that's the whole point because you know you're going to cut it and then reslay it to something different uh -huh. you don't have to worry too much about it i just do the same as everybody else i wrap my yarn around a ruler you know and take half for plain weave and two-thirds for twill and you you think okay well, that'll do we'll see how we'll see what that looks like mm -hmm. we'll make sure you uh, count your picks per inch as well and you think no it's not right so you then reslay it to something else cut the warp and reslay it and then try something else. <clears throat> it's, it's, it, it, you can't go wrong with sampling. That's the other thing that's beautiful about it. You just have got to have a go. You've got to feel free enough to not be worried about making mistakes because it might be that mistake might end up being the thing that makes you make it right. When you come to weave the finished piece, that's a different scenario. You're uh, now okay. into 100% accuracy, yes? Well, my samples are really scruffy businesses because I can't worry about selvages and this, I can't think about that, that neatness while I'm playing around. It's not unimportant. I don't need to. It doesn't need to it. But then when you actually going to finish, weave the finished piece, then you have to get it right. And I, you have to focus on the actual weaving technique to get the selvages straight and get the weft beat up accurate. I find I can't listen to the radio or um, listen to music while really? I'm weaving oh, okay. a finished piece because my mind wanders and then you make a mistake oh, I can't make a mistake on a finished piece but on a sample the mistake might end up being the thing that you decide you know what that's the bit I like the best I did there was one cloth in um, exploring woven fabrics which was a commission a friend of mine was moving house and she, I said I'd make some cushions to match her curtains. And I was doing it in some wool yarn because that was sort of the colour that she wanted. And I, I needed an orange and I didn't have, the only yarn I had in an orange was a fine cotton. So I thought, oh, I'll just, ock, I said, that's a Scottish word for just, I'll have a What go. was it? Och, och. Och? Och, you say och. I'll och. just, um, och, I'll just try this. Och. And, um, <laughs> And the quality, the difference in the cotton and the wool was beautiful. The sheen of the cotton against the wool. And I might not have thought about it if I hadn't have needed a bit of orange just at that point. I thought, well, what, what have I got that's orange? Oh, that'll do. And it actually turned out to be the thing that made the cloth special. You've, you've got a sample. It's such fun. Somebody wants to know, um, let's see, Lisa Dixon um, wants to know, what do you do with your samples? Uh, well, I think when I get older, because you really understand I'm not old at the moment, I have, I do feel I've got to, um, what's the word, assemble them in a more, um, 
a way that maybe in the future other people could look at them. They're pretty scruffy. A lot of them I actually throw out because some of them are really, really bad. You know, they just there's nothing in it that I really want, and I I can't I can't store it. But I keep all the I keep all the samples that I have, and I I'm trying to collate them so they're in a an order that other people might want to see them after I've gone. Do you put them in like in a book or in a tub or what do you use? Uh, I put them in little plastic um, zip, zip folders. Oh, okay. You know, which has got the samples and the finished piece. And it's, I certainly, in terms of teaching, it's quite, I like to have my, my scruffy samples to show people you know to so students to try and free them up and just not worry about it i mean that's when you can just go for it when you're sampling whereas when you're weaving a finished piece it's very serious business got to get it right now <laughs> um kathy broughton wants to know when when you keep your samples i'm assuming you keep all the data you know the threading the yes i the, do yeah okay well, now that I've got, you know, now that I use that, to me, that's what the computer software does for you perfectly. Oh, okay. All right. It, yeah. it, 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 it's such so neatly um, mm -hmm. prints out the design and the threadings and the liftings. And then I've got a, a sheet that I fill in what the width in loom is and the finished width and the percentage shrinkage and the set. That's all listed on the sheets as well. Yeah, you have to have that. Um, I don't mean to jump around, but and I meant to ask this when you were talking about it and I forgot, what was the size of the um, surgical patch? The pad that I actually um, made was about two inches square. Okay, we should have but, said that. But, but to be honest, I'm not sure what the, the surgeons did with it, right? I wove these things and I gave them to them. And then they, I think, I actually had to teach one of the girls to weave themselves. So I had I, I got her a loom and she ended up weaving the samples in the much finer yarn that, that they actually were spinning themselves. So I, I didn't get involved in that later stage, but I think the samples that the actual finished pieces that they're using actually for surgery are quite small. Are they still doing it? So oh, it's, got, it's gone into production. I mean, they're using these, these, you know, I mean, I was very much on the outside of this, but um, I started them off, made them think down a particular road to go. That was a question from Susan also. Yeah. Is it still being used? That's a great story. Oh, oh yes. That, I think, you know, I think I understand that it has helped the success of the shoulder tendon surgery congratulations <laughs> your achievement for mankind that's wonderful yes um do you make um sue malvern wants to know do you do um yarn wrappings do you test or how oh, do you yes yes yes, yes 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 again uh, yes again when talking about mm -hmm. color i do yes i definitely do card car, um card wraps to get stripe proportions Mm -hmm. um, I use the Fibonacci number sequence a lot mm -hmm. to, to um, get good proportions. Um, it depends what project I'm doing, whether I do a lot of card wines or not. But um, yes, it's a technique I, I often use. A couple of people, uh, Patricia uh, Biddington and Janice Waterworth are asking about dyeing. Um, I think you said you use acid dyes, right? You don't use yes. natural dyes? No, because I want to be a very, I want to get a set color. Right. I want to know the color I'm getting and I can reproduce it. And the brand yeah. that you use? Uh, well, there's a company in the UK called Chemtex. It's not really a branded, um, it's their own make. Okay. They're, cheap, they're cheaper than buying the sort of branded dyes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Chemtex. If you, I'm sure they'll post to the US if you really want them to. She may be from England. Probably. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <clears throat> what is uh, Karen LeBlanc wants to know? What is the finest thinnest yarn you use or have used, and what is the thickest? Probably a sixty, a sixty-two silk. 
is the thinnest thread I use. That makes um, me shudder. Yeah. <laughs> Thick yarns, it's diff actually I was weaving today, I was doing a bit of weaving today. Um, thick yarns in fabric weight, maybe a 2.6 worsted or 2.6 NM now they're calling it, aren't they? I don't know, Do you st are you still um, using imperial count systems in the USA? Mm -hmm. So you're using worsted counts? Yeah. About a two eight worsted. It's, it's quite thick, but I would use that, for instance, in a weave structure, which I was doing today, like a diversified plain weave is mm -hmm. a brilliant weave structure for using thick yarns because it allows you to use thick yarns, but you're in, in, um, combining them with very, very fine yarns. So it means you can have a light, a lightweight fabric that's made out of thick yarns and it's not sort of solid and heavy. It's a very nice weave structure for that. A um, couple of questions about your book. Rondi Schmidt wanted to know, um, how are your two books different, the last two books? Well, the Designing Woven Fabrics is only about four shafts. It only covers four shaft work. It's a uh, it, start, it, has, it has three different, um, not chapters, three different sections. The first section is how to construct weaves. That's again, I, I'm very much, you know, to me, a, a cloth is ends and picks interlacing. And there's so many books describe weaves in terms of what the loom does, which is fine. I mean, we all do that as well. But I wanted to take it that step back and, and teach people how to interlace ends and picks together to create a weave structure. So the first is how to construct a twill and how to def and then construct a multiple section sample blanket, how to get different threading plans from a twill that enables you to, to weave a multiple section sample blanket. Uh -huh. So that's the first section is about constructing and weaving a four shaft twill sample blanket. And it's got 10 threadings and 50 lifting se sequences. So you get 500 different squares of different <laughs> patterns. Um, the second section of the uh, designing woven fabrics is talking about the design criteria, how to how to choose colors, how to choose set, how, the, how yarns are different, how to design a stripe, you know, the different criteria that you have to think about. And then the third section is me taking designs from the sample blanket and turning them into designing. And a lot of people have said they quite like that. It's kind of like how, how my mind works. How do I make decisions about which pattern I'm going to use or which set I'm going to use? Yeah. So the, 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 my new book, Exploring Woven Fabrics, follows a similar format, but it's now taking, well, it's, it's taking the weaves from the four shaft sample blanket and putting them onto eight shafts. In other words, becoming a, what they call a block weave, create joining different weave structures together. Uh, it's also covers color and weave effect sampling. So there are, it's four and eight shaft sample blankets. There are, I don't know, can't remember, about 10 different sample blankets. Again, how to construct 10 different sample blankets. Um, well, I can throw my two cents worth in. We yeah. used your Designing Woven Fabrics book um, for a study group. Um, oh, good. It was wonderful. I encourage you all to, if you're looking for a study group topic, it was wonderful. So, um, and I think we talked about this some, but what, why the second book? What was it you felt you didn't cover in the first book that you wanted to do in the second book? Was it the shaft or... Yes, you're talking about designing woven fabrics to exploring. Yeah, I should fabrics. say second and third book. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, basically, I gave up commissioned weaving in 2009. So in other words, a year after I published Designing Woven Fabrics. Uh -huh. We moved to Somerset from South Oxfordshire. I um, didn't want to weave yardage for people anymore, so I sold my great big loom. I also had, for the first time ever, my own studio in my own garden. I used to have to rent space before to weave in. 
and um, I was getting asked by people to, to teach quite a high level course, for people to really become designers in two years. So I had these students coming wow. for two years, they had to come every three months for five days, and we would do, I would teach them different structures and different sampling. And it was really a very, very exciting time. And um, I had all these girls weaving all these different multiple section sample blankets, and we all got very excited about it. And I think it just proved to me that my method works very well, this sampling. And um, I thought I'd write another book based and based again it's a bit in a way the same reason why I did the first one I found students getting excited mm -hmm. about what I was getting them to do so I thought okay clearly there's a book here <laughs> also at my stage in weaving I mean my mission at the moment is to pass my knowledge on I've been weaving a long time I'm no longer really weaving to sell seriously and therefore writing books is a way of um, giving me a reason to weave. Because the other thing that I am, each book is, I, is I'm using the design information I'm trying to get people to weave into real products. And again, people like that attitude of why did I choose those colors? Why did I do a card wine for this project, but not for the next one? It's kind of showing you how I design, which I think is quite interesting or not. Okay. Well, people are asking, um, what is your favorite uh, fiber and what's your favorite weave structure to do? Oh, that's a tricky one. Well, I, I like silk because it just yeah. takes the color so well and wool. I probably do silk and wool mainly, but I, I combine it with other, other fibers um, when, when necessary, but I mainly work in silk and wool. Um, Sorry, what was the other question? Sorry, I've forgotten. No, I was just wondering what your um, oh my favorite weave structure. structure. Oh well, I would all, I would say that the the structures I've included in in exploring woven fabrics are my favorite ones. You know, the double cloth, the deflected double cloth, the stitch double cloth, block weaves. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. What with COVID. And in the UK in particular, I don't, I don't think it's as bad in the US, but we're in lockdown. We've had a whole year of virtually of being in lockdown. In other words, we're not allowed to go out. We're not allowed to meet anybody. So what does one do? Well, if you're a weaver, you weave. And mm -hmm. I'm beginning to think that the other weave structures that I still like, like twills and the lace weaves and the two type, uh, two, what, the two tie unit weaves, are probably the weaves that I don't use quite as much as the ones that I do, my favorite ones, which are the ones that are in designing woven fabrics uh, and exploring woven fabrics. Um, I just have to write another book, won't I? It's given me a reason to weave. There you go. Well, Kathy Group asked, when are you coming to the US so we can take your workshop? <laughs> okay. I don't know. I, ha I, you know, I do have a, a US weavers come over to the UK, I can't promise. We'll have to talk about it. That's all I'm saying at the moment. <laughs> People are asking. Susan, uh, I, had a love, I had a lovely group of ladies from Texas came a couple of years ago. We had a lovely time. Oh, good. You know, we all go down to the beach, in the, you know, after the after the lessons. And um, it, I live in a very pretty. Over. I love a, a very pretty uh -huh. part of the UK. It's a very next to the sea and yet next to the hills as well. All right, um, shrimp. You shrimp. use the term shrimp in talking about a fabric that's somewhere between shadow weave and grip weave. Yes. Is this a term you invented or can be found in other weaving literature? No, it is a complete original Janet yes. Phillips that is. <laughs> I like it. Again, it's just that shadow weave is again, shadow weave. I forget is is in is in it uh, exploring woven fabrics because it is could possibly be my favourite weave structure now that you've reminded me of it okay. because it's so adaptable. It's plain weave. Are you happy? It's plain weave with two colours alternating in the warp and two colours alternating in the weft, so you get vertical and horizontal lines. Log cabin is the simplest shadow weave. It's a plain weave. So it's, it's again, from a, a technical point of view, it's the most 
It's the most lightweight fabric you can ever weave. It's the most functional fabric you'll ever weave because it's the the five the float length is so small, right? So from a commercial weaver, it's just great structurally, everything sorted. And just by playing with set and the weight of yarn, mm -hmm. the range of fabrics is huge, going from log cabin to rep. I mean, structurally, they are identical. There's no difference about them at all. It's just the weight, it's the set and the weight of the yarn. And because between plain weave, log cabin, which is literally a balance cloth plain weave and rep, yes, you're happy, rep is a warp dominant plain weave. There's this huge range of other sets. So I call them shrep. <laughs> Halfway between shadow weave and rep. Thank you, Valerie Musselman. She asked that question. That's a great question. <laughs> but no, great... That, no, I, I dreamt that one up. <laughs> All right. Um, I, it's five o'clock, and I guess we need to wrap this up. Janet, this has been so much fun. Will you come back and do this again? There's so much more we could be talking about. <laughs> Well, you 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 are such an, a delightful um, interviewer. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I don't. I whereas you know, I was a bit dubious about this, but you've made it very easy and very happy well, for me. Well, so then come you. back. I'll come back. I will I'm come back. I'm come over and interview you. How's that? And I'll take a class. Well, that sounds even better. <laughs> I like that's that. excellent. Yeah. Um, if you want to see more of Janet's work um, and learn more about Janet, go to her website, which is janetphillips-weaving.co.uk. And if you want to buy her book, it's a self-published book. Somebody was asking about, is it available in Canada? Um, you can buy it from Janet on her website. And I know in the U.S. you can get it at Lone Star Loom Room, and that's lonestarloomroom.com. Um, and you can probably contact Janet and she'll know who else is carrying it. Um, I, I want to really thank um, Made in America Yarns. Thank you so much for being our sponsor today. Um, as you're getting ready to go buy some yarn, check out their website. They have some wonderful, unique yarns. They've got the basics, 8-2 cotton, but look at some of their unique yarns they have. Um, they are the, the city of fiberly love because they're in Philadelphia. I thought that was clever. Um, if you want to be a sponsor, we would appreciate you coming on and being a sponsor. You can contact us at weavespindye.org. It's there on your screen. Um, Textiles and Tea is supported by the generous donations to the Fiber Trust. If you would like to see more programming like this, um, please support HGA by becoming a member or donating to the Fiber Trust. You can join and donate at WeSpendDye.org. Now, today was recorded on Facebook Live. So if you missed something, if you want to see this again, Janet was so entertaining. I'm sure you want to see this again. Um, or if somebody you know, missed it, you can tell them about it. You can go to the HGA Facebook page and watch it. There's been some confusion. You don't have to have a um, Facebook account to watch this on Facebook. So just to clarify that. Um, next week, we have tapestry artist extraordinaire, Rebecca Mezoff, who's going to join us for tea. We're very excited about that. Um, thank you all for coming this afternoon. Thank you, Janet. I thank hope you'll you. come back and see us again. I'll see you all next week. Happy tea. Thank you.